Hi there, welcome to This Can Happen session on supporting transgender mental health at work. Uh, please remember that we're eager for you to send in your questions using the, using the chat box on your screen. They are anonymous questions, so please feel free to send them in. My name is Alexandra Beauregard. I'm going to be facilitating this session today. Uh, I'm a professor of organizational psychology at Birkbeck, University of London, and transgender uh, employee issues in the workplace are a special research interest of mine. I'd like to introduce you to our speakers today. With us, we have Claire Birkinshaw, a lecturer in childhood and education at the Carnegie School of Education and a former head teacher in the north of England. We have Emily Hamilton, vice president of strategic change at RS Components. And we have Preston Taylor, head of content publication and enrichment at RS Components. And the context for today's session really is that research tells us that about 60% of transgender people have experienced discrimination in the workplace relating to their gender identity. More than 53% have said that they would felt the need to hide their trans status from colleagues at some time during their careers. And one in three UK employers report that they would not hire a transgender candidate. So really, that, that has a lot of mental health implications for transgender employees at work. So we're interested here in understanding some of the mental health consequences that trans employees face as a result of these types of discrimination, both direct forms and indirect forms in the workplace, and to try to understand how employers can be understanding and supportive of staff who are transitioning or who have transitioned. So I'd like to start off by asking our panel members how was your mental health impacted at work by the process of transitioning? Who would like to take that first? I can start. I Thanks, Preston. <laughs> um, I think when you first start transitioning, um, th there's so many things to think about, not just work. Um, and when we have things going on in our personal life, obviously that really does severely impact work. Um, for me personally, um, it, it was about seven or eight years ago now. Um, I had a lot of um, other issues going on, so it was very difficult telling my family um, due to sort of the background and the, the upbringing I had. Um, it was difficult telling my friends. Um, it was difficult to try and understand it myself as well. So there was a lot of inner turmoil going on, and I really suffered quite severe mental health, uh, trying to come to terms with who I really was and how I'd been hiding that, what that meant for me and my relationships and my family. And obviously then that had an impact on work. And, and you know, I wasn't my, my usual self. I wasn't performing at my best. And so, you know, my, my work slipped, my, my work ethic slipped and it was, it was a very difficult time. I think you're on mute, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> ah, the first question. Claire, could you share your experiences with us, please? Yeah, I, I think that, um, so there's a decision-making process that you know that when you do come out and you say, look, this is me, everything changes, you know, the way in which you are then perceived by others. And, uh, you know, I agree with what Preston was then saying. If you, you know, consider this as an holistic aspect to, you know, your, your life, it is so whilst you may then come out at work, you also then have to then come out to friends. You then have to then come out to uh, family members. So everything, I, I, in one sense, you could argue that everything in, one, in life uh, is disrupted. And, and then trying to then adjust to that disruption and that by coming out that isn't just at that moment in time it's probably been, well it's certainly in my uh, my case this has been a, a, an internal conversation that I've had since childhood uh, about what does this then mean why am I thinking like this who uh, is there anybody else then like me and whilst I did come out in childhood it was then uh, suppressed it was then put into a box thinking that it would go away, you know, using the language that other people then, you know, say, like, it's a phase, you know, you, you pass through it, it's related to puberty, all of those things, but it just never did. Um, so when somebody then does come out, then to them that might feel, um, you know, that where's this new information then come from? But for the person, that, you know, such as myself, articulating that, this has been a long, long process that's been evolving for, for many, many, many years. But also that 
you are then having to come out to various different like people and there's a there's a range of emotions that you then go through you anticipate that you are going to be rejected you anticipate that you will experience discrimination and prejudice why because that's what we see within uh, within society um and you also feel guilty well i certainly did by 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 saying how i you know who I am out aloud. I felt guilty for, for doing that, um, that somehow I would be I, I don't know, asking people to, uh, to accept me as I, as I am. And that was, that was really, really, uh, really, really hard, particularly when people then say uh, such phrases as, it's, so, they're, so they're experiencing a bereavement and they say that in front of you as well, which compounds the guilt. Uh, and the shame that you are then feeling um, that they feel that they've lost someone. <laughs> and you're saying, but this is me. And they're going, well, it feels like I've lost someone. So that was really hard. Thank you very much. I'm not putting myself on mute again, even if I do make weird noises in the background, just to prevent any more awkward transitions. <laughs> Emily? Yeah, I mean, a lot, a, lot, yeah, a lot resonates from, uh, from what um, Preston and Claire have said. I mean, I, I'm, I guess I'm the baby trans of the group. I came out only last September uh, and socially transitioned this year, in fact. Um, and for me, you know, very similar to Claire, I, you know, I came out a couple of times previously in my life, um, once when I was 11, once when I was in my early 20s, uh, to very adverse reactions. So, so I was slammed very firmly back into the closet. And, and for me, the, my sort of, I say my last and final coming out, although you're, you're coming out all the time, you have to sort of repeat that process. Um, but the, the, the point where I think, from my perspective, I, I accepted myself was, was last September. And that was a crisis point. So I'd, I'd attempted suicide in August last year uh, as a result of, of worsening mental health and, in fact, the adverse reaction of me coming out uh, to family. So for me, coming out at work, it was, it was almost the last throw of the dice uh, to find somewhere where I would be accepted as who I was uh, and I wouldn't be adversely seen. Um, and I'm very lucky. I'm one, I'm one of the lucky ones that I have a, a very accepting employer. And I found my, my support network, my ally network at work. Um, and the surprising thing from a mental health perspective, so apart from the adrenaline rush that, that seemed to last for about two months as I went through the process of coming out to various people. Um, and, and it was just exhausting all the time. I found the most surprising thing was how much extra mental capacity I'd unlocked as a result of coming out, not hiding, not pretending to be somebody else, not worrying that somebody would find out my awful secret uh, because I'd accepted it wasn't an awful secret. So it's, it's um, I guess it's a bit of a roller coaster of emotion. Um, but but the, the importance of having a supportive work network and, and allies at work, um, for me, I can't underestimate that. I, you know, one of the things I've said is, had I not had that reaction uh, when I came out, and, and Preston was one of the first people I came out to, uh, you know, what were the odds of having another trans person in my own department? Um, I may not be here today. Uh, and it, it was as serious as that. Thank you very much, Emily. That's, I mean, you bring up a really important um, issue here, which is that the reaction from employers and, and from colleagues uh, within, within the work organization, I think, has, has a really big impact, doesn't it, on our mental health. Uh, Claire, would you, would you like to tell us a bit about how, how you felt supported or not uh, by, by your employers, by the wider staff, um, in terms of your mental health on this journey? Yeah, it, it was... Um... It presented many challenges because I was working in education. So it's not that you are just working with adults; you're also then working with children, you know, and, and, uh, and families as well. Um, so that you know uh, presents multiple like coming outs. Um, I, I think that through that process of coming out, that when you do say, you know, "This is this is me. This is who I am." You, you remember those, the reactions of others, so almost it becomes indelible. It, you know, it forms, I suppose it feels like it's tattooed onto you in, in some ways. And some people 
were helpful and supportive and you know and absolutely fantastic but also uh, some of the people um were, were less so and some of the really hurtful things although they probably didn't mean it to be like hurtful is they uh, would say oh we don't know what to say anymore as though you're this completely new person you know and the skills that you've got your attributes those attributes have then been forgotten it's like you've some form of etch-a-sketch has then you know like happened you've been erased and I would say, but I just want to talk about the little things. You know, I don't, you know, that hasn't then changed. Um, so there were there were multiple challenges when I first then came out, uh, which uh, they've still left a mark on me. Um, and some people were nowhere near as supportive as they uh, then uh, should be. Um, and, and there were some incredibly hurtful things that were then uh, said. You know, the fact that I wasn't employed as Claire, uh, I mean, that will be something that will always then, you know, stay with me, that somehow I was this different person. Um, and that's something that, you know, I, I still ruminate on. Um, but other people have done some amazing things as well. Um, and the way in which they converse, you know, and the development of like new friendships, so that that's then taken place. There has been a lot of a lot of people within my life, but I've then encountered uh, new people, um, and they've been really really supportive. Uh, and it's just the inclusion. It's just the inclusion in the everyday, and that you don't necessarily want to talk about, you know, like trans issues. Whilst that's important, I know we're talking about this now. But it is those everyday conversations that makes you feel that you are accepted as part of the human race. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you, Claire. Preston, could you share with us your experience when with, with your employers and your colleagues? Yeah, I think relating back to what was said um, a few minutes ago uh, in relation to always coming out. Uh -huh. um, you know, there's every time you move into a new job or you move into a new role in department, you you always you know, at some point it will be a discussion or a topic that, that comes up. For me, the first time I came out um, in a workplace was really, really difficult. Um, I had a, a manager that did not understand at all, um, you know, comments like, we can order you the male uniform, but we can't refer to you by he and him. Um, the, the, just a real lack of understanding. And it, and it also became a little bit of a joke as well some people thought it was funny or that it was weird um and i think relating back to what claire said it, we just want to talk about the everyday things i haven't changed as a person i still like the same things i still have the same feelings um it was just my outward appearance has changed and i think people often forget that um and it's something that's made me really passionate now about speaking up and um, helping workplaces um, and supporting people within our business um, because as we've talked about the, the, the mental health and the, the, the depression and the thoughts that you go through and the struggles that you face um, it's, it's not something difficult for people to come to terms with or to deal with um, you know it's just about how you position conversations the language that you use um, it's about arming yourself and going away and, and researching if you don't understand or knowing where to go to, to get the information. Um, so for me, when I, when I initially came out, it was it was quite traumatic and it's it's something that stayed with me for a long time. And then you have those worries and concerns when that subject comes up or when you you know disclose your status in a new workplace. There is always, as Claire said, it's very, very ingrained in you. It's it's tattooed on you. Um, you know, how are people going to react? Will it be the same as before? Um, you know, am I going to have to find another another job, another position because this isn't going to go very well? Um, so it, it is a real, real big concern. And I think people underestimate um, just how big it is for somebody to come out in the workplace. Um, and, you know, just just be there and be supportive really well i think i think these stories um you know give us some some insight into why 
research tells us that 53% of, of trans employees feel the need to hide their gender identity from their employers. You know, we, we can see why these are negative consequences in many cases that people would, would seek to avoid. Um, Emily's talked a bit about this, the impact that, that sort of hiding who you are and having to constantly keep that concealed, um, the impact that that has uh, on, on you know, your, your energy and kind of your, your cognitive capacity and how so much of that was freed up once you were able to, to express your gender identity uh, freely in the workplace. Um, I'd be curious to hear about, about from you, Preston and, and Claire, what your experiences are in terms of you know, the impact on mental health and well-being that that concealment, that that hiding, um, that that sort of concealing yourself from your employer has before before you come out. Yeah, well, so there is the, that um, almost a management strategy on on your part, really. You know, thinking about what you can say and what you then cannot say, and being extremely careful. Um, and that has, uh, well, I think it has a, a, a huge impact um, because you are then spending more time and energy thinking about what you should then be doing, what you should then be saying, wanting to then talk um, and, and, and trying to contain that just it, it, it involves so much energy um, and it, it's then you know, that, that cognitive like, energy that could be then spent on on other things. And so there is, you know, and I completely uh, agree with what Emily was then saying, by coming out, by not having to hide anymore, you don't you don't even think about that. And I know that it, in terms of the number of books that I've then read through, you know, the work that I then do, and I was just counting just recently, so in the, the last two years, then I've engaged with over twelve I didn't kill up, uh, over two hundred books, and then if I think I thought previously that I would be able to then read so much then literature, uh, I just would have thought that that was impossible. But now, um, then I, I feel that I'm able then to do that because I'm not distracted in the in the way that I was then previously, and that gives me a real sense of like well-being as well by doing the types of things that I am interested in. So if you think about flourishing as a human being and this, you know, the idea of actualization, I've then got to this point where I feel like I am actualizing, which makes a huge difference to the work that I now then do in the workplace. I think there's, there's a, a lot more to it that, than people realise as well. So if you speak to any actor um, around after they've had a full day acting, um, how draining that really is and how emotionally, mentally tired they are, it's the same. So when you're not your true self at work, when you're acting as somebody else, um, it's something that you have to consciously think about all the time. And as a trans person being really uncomfortable with your body as well, you have that on top of things. So you'll be worrying about the way you look um, or, you know, if you're not out, are you giving things away? Will, will people figure out, you know, your, your secret as, as it's already been sort of claimed to, um, it is just emotionally and mentally, physically draining. And there isn't really much time left for anything else and, and you know we talked about mental health as well that on top of the the acting um there can be days weekends where you just you you're in bed all weekend because you've spent the week going through all of those emotions um all of those worries and concerns um that you you just really struggle to function um so it, it can be really really difficult those are very powerful accounts, especially of, of the, the recuperation that would be needed from a full work week of, 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 of keeping up the, these facades. This sort of leads us to, to a question that I'm interested in, in terms of, um, I, I think there's a, a perception among, among some people that, that transgender mental health issues are a fairly niche area of, of staff well-being. Um, given that the you know assumption is that statistically speaking this is a fairly small percentage of the workforce but do, do you think this is a, a larger area in terms of well-being than, than perhaps we think Emily what do you think yeah I mean we, we talked about the statistic I think it's sort of 56 percent of trans people not feeling comfortable to to be themselves at work um, you only have to look at any large organization I talk about this a lot about our organization um, there are three out trans people in my global organization at the moment. 
If I run the numbers, the numbers say there are other people in our organisation who don't feel potentially comfortable to come out. Um, and I, I think to dismiss it as a niche issue, um, I don't think that's tenable anymore. You know, we are human beings and you know, certainly one of the, one of the, the, the rallying cries are trans rights are human rights. And we, we're not talking about additional rights or special rights or special pleading. All trans people are looking for are the, the rights and the, the acceptance that any other person would, accept, would expect within the, within the workplace. Um, so, no, I don't think it's niche, and I just know, you know, we've just talked about it, the harm that is done by having people who don't feel safe and comfortable to be themselves at work. Um, it, you know, it, it's not just a personal issue, it's not just an emotional issue, it's good business. Um, if you have a number of people, it doesn't matter how many of them there are, but your businesses are so interconnected nowadays. If you have one person who is using 50, 60, 70 percent of their mental capacity hiding their identity, they're not giving that to you as an employer. They're not giving that into the workplace, to their teams, to the people around them. Um, so it shouldn't be niche. It's good business and it's good humanity. I think that makes a lot of sense. Preston, what do you think? Um, something that Emily says quite a lot, which I quite like, is um, when people say, um, I don't know a, a trans person, or I don't know a trans person at work, um, how do you know? Mm. Because there, there are so many more people, as Emily's mentioned, that are just not ready and not comfortable enough to be themselves at work. Um, so, yeah, I completely agree. It, it is claimed to be niche. Um, we, we are called a minority, but actually there are so many more people out there that, you know, really are struggling with this. And as Emily said, it really is good business. Um, you know, if, if you support those people and they then feel comfortable to be themselves, then they, they give that back and they, they support the business too. That makes a lot of sense. Claire, do you agree? Yeah, I, I think in some ways you could argue that it's a, it's a barometer, isn't it? Um, that it, it gives an indication of what the culture is like within the workplace, you know, in terms of trans acceptance. Because if there is prejudice against trans people, I could probably argue there's probably prejudice that, against other people as well. Um, and that then shapes this workplace culture. So maybe you will also have within the, uh, within the workplace culture, you know, possibly sexism there's probably classism you know there's homophobia there's maybe racism you know uh, ableism and so on as well where these hierarchies are allowed to then like develop and then become quite powerful and then controlling which actually suppress other people's identities but also their ability in which to contribute fully to the organization so i think if they if workplaces are trans inclusive it would, i would suggest that they are then trans oh, sorry inclusive of other identities so there's a good climate within the organization where everybody feels connected everybody feels that they then belong so rather than seeing it as niche actually see it as uh, you know a barometer of to the wider workplace uh, culture that makes a lot of sense thank you so i think now we can move on to talking a little bit more about what practical steps organizations can take how can workplaces be understanding and supportive of employees who are transitioning who would like to tackle this first should we go back to emily yeah um yeah so obviously with some recent experience of this i mean i think I mean, the first point is 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 be human. Um, don't don't leave your humanity at the door. This is not uh, this is not some horrific process, although it can be made horrific. This this is actually this should be the happiest point in in a person's life that they're able to be open and able to be honest about who they are. So um, humanity is really important, but but underpinned, I think, by a knowledge of um, the legal framework for transgender people. Um, some understanding about, um, I hesitate to call them the do's and don'ts because that sounds very prescriptive, but just some of these things are quite common sense. Some of the things you, you should be saying, some of the things that, that, might, that might be quite offensive. Um, and, and a good barometer of that is uh, if you wouldn't feel comfortable somebody asking you that question, don't ask it of other people. Um, but I also think businesses have a duty to start to think about the practical aspects of what it means for somebody transitioning. Uh, some of those are very business focused, um, changing names, 
identities on corporate systems, um, helping the trans person to not see what we call our dead name, our old name. Um, that's, that's a really big change to mental health. That was the first thing I did, uh, and it happened to happen during lockdown, so I was stuck at home uh, and changed my avatar and my name on our corporate systems, and, and the lift to my mental health from doing that was, was massive. Uh, but having those processes in place so people aren't having to make it up as they go along, that's crucial. Um, and don't get caught out with some of the things which should be really simple. Um, you know, the, the perennial and miserable topic of which bathroom should you use? Well, it's pretty obvious which bathroom I'm going to be using. Um, that shouldn't be a topic that has to be discussed with me. It should just be a, a thing. OK, that's fine. You, you, you're in transition. This is how this will work. Um, and not putting the pressure back on the person who's coming out because, you know, I've certainly had a, a few times where people have blundered um, inadvertently and, and it has been very upsetting and it's that sort of death by a thousand cuts and they've then come back to me to say how upset they were that they, they you know, that they blundered or how bad they felt. I guarantee it is nowhere near as bad as the trans person who's having to go through this time after time after time. So anything a business can do just to make this a... It's an administrative process, making an administrative process with the humanity of realising you have a person who's just released probably the biggest thing they've been holding on to in their life. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. And I like what you say about this being a very joyful occasion. And so in a sense, it's an administrative process, but it's almost like a celebration at the same time, isn't it? It should be. It should feel more like that, shouldn't yeah. it, in the workplace? Not that many workplaces make many things feel like a celebration, but this is a good opportunity. Claire, what are your views? Um, I, I think that, you know, from my perspective, um, I, you know, I try to gauge what uh, an environment is like. So, you know, I listen to conversations, the way in which people talk about like other people. So that gives you a sense of how inclusive uh, an organization is, but also just the, the little things as well, you know, what may be then on a notice board. So these little signifiers, these signs give you a sense of how well, you know, various groups of people are supported within an organization. But also like last week was Trans uh, Awareness Week. And so if an organization then doesn't do uh, anything with, with, uh, with regards to trans awareness, then, you know, as, as, a, as a trans individual, I recognise that. So I then think, well, that's missing. So why is that missing? What does that then say? And, you know, and particularly where an organisation sees itself as an anchor within the community. Uh, so it's that transmission of a culture that if you are saying that you are inclusive and you are an anchor institution within the community, but then you do not do these things, then that then positions trans people as it, it, put, it feels like we, we've been placed on the periphery, uh, that we are, you know, continuing to be like othered. So I think, see, that within workplace culture, um, there are multiple signals that a organ, uh, an organisation can transmit to demonstrate its inclusivity. And so it can be from the little things to actually the really big things. Even, you know, that if, if the organisation has a flag that's then flown and then changes the flag, don't just think as well because, you know, with LGBT History Month, that because you then fly the flag for this month, uh, then that's it, you know, that's all identities then included. So I do feel that, you know, that recognition of... Um, yeah, of certain times of the year are really, really important. And we see those uh, as signals as to how inclusive you really are. Yeah, it's symbolic, but it matters. Mm, completely. Preston, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think um, so. It, it's it's a journey that we've you know been going on for a couple of years now in our current business. Um, and um, I'm chairman of our LGBTQ plus community. And I think that there's a multitude of things that you can do to support trans trans people. Um, but what what's been really successful for us is that we have key pillars around um, race, uh, around gender, around well-being, including financial health, mental health, and the LGBTQ plus community. Now we've been very vocal in involving our leaders in that um, and helping them to really push from the top down to help others understand why it's part of our strategy, um, how it supports people. And it's really about creating that culture where everybody's celebrated for who they are, 
no matter you know what our difference is to really um, support one another to understand one another and within our community something that really really done well and was very important to me is to educate uh -huh. and to allow people to come to us for the answers to the questions they might have so that they're better equipped to have those conversations to understand um, and to, to pass it on so to speak um, so yeah we've like I say we've been on this journey a couple of years but as Emily said you know she she found somewhere where she felt safe and she was able to to be her true self and come out so um, it is really important there's a lot of really good uh, suggestions there and this leads us very nicely into some of the questions that we've been getting from audience members and I'd like to read one of those out now. So the first one says, as an ally, what else can we or I do to support those around me? We already have a network set up, a safe space to talk. We have all actively included our pronouns onto signatures and we educate on Trans Awareness Week and seek support from external sources. What more would be helpful? I don't know who wants to, to tackle this first. Yeah. Well, I would probably say that. I mean, that sounds absolutely fantastic. Uh, you, you know, it, it really, really does. Um, I, mean, I suppose that all of that will then, that will make a difference. Um, and, you know, it'll then make a difference by the, you know, productivity, the performance of of uh, individuals. But that sounds absolutely fantastic. Well, you know, that organisation is then doing it. I think it's just that is to recognise the humanness within within ourselves. Uh, and, and so that activity is, is clearly demonstrating an inclusive uh, approach. Um, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure what more then to add, really, at this moment in time, because it sounds brilliant. I, I think I'd add something. I mean, there's, 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 there's something that happens when people aren't watching. Um, so having the formal structures, having the support networks, being allies, pronouns, is fabulous, it really helps. What I say to allies, what else can you do, is, is if you hear, you're in a conversation where people don't think there is a trans person around and they're saying something transphobic or, or frankly, racist or homophobic or ableist, challenge it. It's, it's your duty to challenge people who are expressing bigoted views and, and making the workplace a less safe place. Uh, I was asked the same question on a, on a work-based uh, session not long ago. And actually, one of the participants said, well, you know, sometimes we like to have a bit of banter. And that is my like, red alert word. I hate the word banter. And I curl up inside because it tends to mean it's, it's covering for something which probably isn't pleasant for other people. And when I challenged that, that person said, well, I know, you know, I know all the people in that group. You know, it's OK. It's just my team. But my point to them was 18 months ago, they knew me or they thought they did. They didn't know me. They didn't know who I was. And you're putting people into a situation where they potentially you have another trans person there who's not out, who has to listen to that. So be an ally, challenge it, um, and make sure that you don't allow those sort of comments to pass. That's a really useful suggestion. Preston, do you have anything to add, or should we move on to the next question? No, I think they covered it very well. Pretty comprehensive, isn't it? OK, so our next question says, I am really keen to talk about this in my workplace, but I don't want to say the wrong thing or cause anxiety. What can you advise? Wow. Um, I, I, well, I guess my advice is there is a lot of information out there. Um, you know, the internet can be a, a thoroughly bad thing. The internet can be an amazing <laughs> thing. Um, I think there are lots of trans-friendly uh, charities that you can, you can look to for information to help you understand uh, the, the, the trans experience. There are lots of books written by trans people, and that, that's really important, listen to trans people and what they say. I think understanding us is the most important thing. Don't try and use the first trans person you come across as a substitute for Google, um, because it gets really tiring um, you know, to have to keep you know, I, I, I'm quite passionate about educating people, but not all of us want to do that all the time. Um, so just understand the issues that we face. And when you see things written down, and it's, it's a very hostile environment at the moment for trans people, certainly in the UK, when you see something written, ask yourself the questions. Who wrote it? What was their agenda? What are they referencing? Were any trans people spoken to as part of that? And, and, and just have an awareness about who we are. I think that, that would be the best thing I could suggest. 
Thank you very much, Emily. I'm going to read out another question now, which is, have you noticed an improvement in the workplace? And what are your tips on how workplaces can put in some immediate changes? Preston, did you want to tackle this one? Yeah, I think we've, we've, we've partially covered that. Um, the first thing uh, relates back to what Emily was saying about systems. Um, I think it's really important to have policies in place um, and you know to understand what changes might be required in systems. I think some some workplaces are quite a bit behind when it comes to titles and um, and things like that. So um, that's that's a, a good first step. Policies wise, um, I think it's really important to understand that, I mean, particularly in the UK, um, the, the, there's legislation um, and uh, we, we've sort of looked at our policies to make sure that they they have the protected characteristics in um, and that they, you know, are, are supportive of any discrimination in the workplace. Um, so I think there are a, a good couple of first steps that will um, help trans people feel supported. Um, it, it, again, it depends on the size of the workplace, but we found that communities have been really successful because, um, you know, myself and Emily being able to talk about our experiences and educate from, from the, the perspective of, you know, we've been through that, um, we know what would be supportive, what would help. Um, I think it's really important to, to draw on uh, people within the community that that might be able to help you with those answers or help you with suggestions. Um, so they'd, they'd be my, my first couple of tips, really. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And I think we have time for one more question before this session wraps up. And this is quite an interesting question. It says, how can workplaces support not only staff that are transitioning, but those who have families that are going through this? Um, I mean, Claire, would you like to... Oh, sorry. Emily, go ahead. Um, I was just going to say, I mean, that's been one of the joyous things really since I came out. Um, in the time I came out, I came out at work openly last September. I've been contacted by two separate colleagues uh, in different territories that I've met who have asked for my advice about a transitioning child in their family uh, for confidential advice. And for me, that's been the best thing about being open and frank about who I am at work is that I'm able potentially to, to support and guide families who are doing the best thing they can possibly do for their for their children. Um, so I would say there's lots we can do by being visible. Being visible is the key thing. Uh, and, you know, supporting families is, is an absolutely essential thing. Uh, one of the things that the, the group that Preston chairs uh, and I'm a member of, we're very clear that it's open to staff members and their families. Uh, and we have we have colleagues in the states who have transgender a transgender son who joins our quiz night, and it is just a community for them as well. So yes, opening up to to families is really really crucial. I think just to add on to what Emily then says, it's it's also like with hope as well, isn't it? I think what families can do is that if a child then comes out, a young person then comes out, they project. The child in the future and they think oh you know this is going to be really problematic they're going to experience prejudice discrimination and so on and that anxiety can be picked up by you know a family member so you know by being visible in in the organization you know so where people then see that this organization is inclusive it gives a sense of hope it gives a sense of hope that people will be employed, that people will be accepted. And just going back on to the, you know, the point uh, earlier about what you can then do, you know, the person at the top of the pyramid, for them to demonstrate their trans inclusion has a huge ripple effect. You know, one example being Joe Biden. You know, Joe Biden in their speech, you know, including trans people within their speech, that sent an incredibly powerful message out to, well, in terms of like Joe Biden, not just across the USA, but across the world. And that for me really, really heartened uh, me. And I'm not an American citizen. Um, so. Okay, I think that we've come to the end of our questions now and we've come almost to the very end of the session. So I would like to wrap up by saying thank you very much to our audience members who have attended and who have sent in such interesting questions for us to, to address. And most of all, I'd like to thank our panel members so much for coming today and for sharing their stories with us and for considering these 
really, really important questions this afternoon. And that is the end of this session. And that is also the end of day two of This Can Happen. So I'm going to throw over to Zoe now in the studio. Yes, indeed. It is now the end of day two and thank you so much for joining us. We started off this morning with our Asian content and we've had such inspiring day as you can see from this final session of the day. Um, what has really um, been so great is to see all your engagement, all the chats, all the comments, all the questions and that really is our aim with This Can Happen um, to empower you to go back to your workplace with solutions um, and, and to talk more about mental health. So thank you so so much for joining us today thank you to this panel today and we look forward to seeing you for the third and final day of this can happen 2020